phone. All right, and we are recording. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining um, Five, Point, Five Points Art Gallery Studios' fifth annual This is America group exhibition. Um, this exhibition is a, a very popular point, one for the gallery, as it highlights all artists of color and gives the artists the platform to control and take over their narr narrative of their lived experience experiences associated with America. Um, and we leave it broad and open for two reasons, because um, our, our experiences are not uh, monolithic and um, our practices aren't either. And so you should see and walk around and peruse and now you're gonna get a chance to talk to the artists about different aesthetics, their approaches and their concepts surrounding their pieces that are included and what touch points they're um, commenting on um, regarding this subject matter. And so um, I wanna also say hi to the artists. I am not there. This is the first opening I'm not physically at. I am in New Orleans helping my sister move. And so um, I apologize but for not seeing some of you directly in person, but I appreciate those who are able to come in and call in. And uh, I also wanna give special thanks to Chayla Garcia. She runs the Walker's Point Center for the Arts in Milwaukee, but helping um, lead this um, opening with Rhonda Gatlin Hayes, who is an artist, not only in the exhibition, but she's uh, the gallery assistant. And so, um, and Chayla will help moderate um, just in case I get cut off. But again, I wanna thank everyone for coming in, supporting the gallery, this, this exhibition in its fifth condition of it and the gallery's like 28th or 29th exhibition in total. And so um, within the show, there are 15 artists highlighted. Um, not all artists might be present or call in because some of them are actually traveling. One is um, coming back from Thailand um, and some are traveling right now. And um, as always, we encourage the audience to interject um, when they like to. We, this is not a lecture series where you have to wait to the end. We want it to be comfortable and conversational. And so if something pops up in your mind, let us know so you can ask the artist directly. The artist can talk amongst each, each other directly too. And um, yeah, so it's supposed to be light, simple, a way for the artist and the audience to connect directly and take away the mystery <laughs> of who is, what is an artist, what does the artist look like, talk like, sound like, and um, you know, take away like guessing narratives behind the works you might see. So I will um, start off with the first artist who called in, um, Kamika Patton. Kamika is located in Charlotte, and then I'll let Taylor kind of take over too. Um, and Kamika has also exhibited with the gallery a few times. And so she did have a solo show in the gallery about two, two and a half years ago. But she has some new works in the show. And then I'll let you again explain some stuff about yourself, talk about the piece you included, maybe if talk about the title and describe it and you know why you wanted to include it in the show. Oh, like right. <laughs> um, and I think you are cutting off. I can't, everything's kind of like frozen for me. So I can kind of hear you kind of in and out for me. Um, but if it's my turn to go, uh, thank you so much for including me in the show. It's always a pleasure to work with Five Point Gallery. It's always a pleasure to work with you, Fatima. Um, I was really kind of, I would say nervous. I'm not going to take that. Hey, I think I'm back. We can that kicked out. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, I was actually quite nervous uh, to put a piece in the show because my work isn't very political at all. I don't talk about my upbringing very often. I don't talk about America very often. But this piece was inspired by a conversation that I was having with a sister of mine about. Um, 
surrendering in the midst of chaos or surrendering when chaos is knocking on your door. Um, thinking about uh, the ability to listen while in pain or the ability to listen while just activity is happening around you. And so I thought that would be a wonderful fitting for maybe the, the theme of this show or the, the intention of this show. So um, this, this body of work that I'm working on right now is very much centered on being in South um, in the southern part of the country, um, definitely infiltrated with African American medicine, folklore, and myths and teachings. Um, so I really wanted to make it very particular about uh, a Black woman's uh, aesthetic and point of view while looking at the world beyond just, you know, the place that I grew up in. But yes, uh, this work was, I think, fit this this, this, this gallery or this show right now because it is talking about um, the conversations that we have with each other, the conversations that we will continue to have just as we continue to evolve and grow and develop. Um, do we see things changing? How are we changing as individuals that can then affect the community? Um, this piece was also inspired by, I had just got back from Puerto Rico witnessing what was happening um, in wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, Puerto Rico and thinking about the shifts and changing that, that is happening over there. So, yeah, I hope that didn't take up too much time, but uh, that's kind of what the work was centered on about beyond just uh, the Black gaze, including the Black gaze, but beyond the Black gaze, um, how are we shifting and changing and talking about those shifts and changes? Thank you. And then, Trailer, let me know when you want to jump in. And I wanted to say, you know, again, we leave the con the the inclusions broad, and I think that's the common, um, I guess, concern or thought. Like everything is what we consider is staunchly political. When I feel like almost every minute and grand experience that we have is political, just existing as that. And so I'm glad you brought that up. And so for the audience too, I hope you. Um, this is the importance of the artist talk too, is to learn like some of the nuances that you might see from works that are like less staunchly political, what we would see in the media per se, and what we um, might, um, I guess, stereotype our experiences to be. And so um, I, the, the next artist I'm gonna jump to, cause I think she's not feeling so well. And just in case she wants to jump off is Nia Wilson. So Nia, do you wanna um, speak about your piece and describe it? And Nia's work is on the opposite side of the gallery that you're seeing on the screen. Um, yes, what I'm just trying to share my... Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, my name is... Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not there. I'm not feeling so good today, but my name is Nia Wilson. Um, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I graduated from UWM. I got my degree in journalism and art. So I worked with Fatima before with Momoka and Iron Woman. So thank you Fatima for the opportunity to show in the gallery. Um, so this work, I kind of, cause you know, with work and stuff it's kind of sometimes it's hard to like produce as an artist. So I just found this show an opportunity to um, make some new work and kind of just you know, explore like different material. So I just kind of went to Blick and I just looked at their, you know, their printing material. Um, and how I do my practice is a lot of body prints. So like I will paint myself and I'll make a print. So, um, you know, when you think of America, you think the flag, you think of, you know, the history and, you know, as a black person in America, we're like, brown people too in America is really hard. We have a really harsh history. So at first I was thinking of, um, I'm just talking about the process. Um, I did some prints and I tried to um, put sugar instead of like acrylic on top of it. Cause sugar was like the first export um, through slavery that came out of America before cotton, it was sugar. So I thought about that, but it, didn't kind of translate well. So I um, kind of like this fiber is called Kozo, K-O-Z-O fiber paper. And it's a Japanese fiber. 
and it's made out of bark and the bark is kind of stretched. And uh, what's been on my heart is this kind of this idea of injustice. So I had some other pieces that show for Tima, but I didn't put in the show. Um, but I played with, you know, the movement of my hands, like war and peace, like, you know, the peace sign, but also is bloody. You know, we talk about peace, but we're for war. We promote peace, but people promote the opposite. So I played with that a little bit. Um, so a bit about this is that I just kind of experiment with this idea of justice. Um, so in the end, I um, use graphite. So I put oil, instead of putting acrylic, usually I put acrylic on my body. I put oil and then I use a black graphite um, on this causal fiber paper. Um, and the title of the piece is called Escroto Jurisdiction. So Escroto in Spanish and Portuguese means dark and jurisdiction means the extent of the power to make legal deci decisions and judgment. And I have kind of like this figure of a person. There's no context of what this person is. They're just dark. So when I think of justice, when I think of systems, especially not just the United States, but around the world, there's a lack of, you know, there's a absence, there's a darkness um, to justice. Justice isn't fair and it leaves, um, it leaves pain, it leaves suffering, but it's also like, um, you know, a judgment. So I'm thinking of judgment. I'm thinking of, you know, the, the association with the color dark. Um, so, I kind of left it a bit abstract so it can, you know, the, the person or the viewer can make their own idea of what it may be, but um, essentially it's a person and thinking of just justice, uh, the, the decisions of lawmaking, how that impacts people. Um, and you could put in any different type of situation. So yeah, so that is just it. I just took this opportunity more to explore different fibers, um, different material, and also different type of techniques um, that I typically do in my work. So thank you. Thanks, Nia. I'm glad you explained your piece and um, I'm give you some like viewer comments that, um, that I've heard already. Um, with, within your abstraction, you're giving the audience an, an, an opportunity to pull what they thought and some people are like, is it Black Jesus? Is it oh. Frederick Douglass? And then the fact that you're talking about justice and obscure and law and order, what have you, and a balance, I um, wanted to share that feedback of what some viewers were thinking. They really liked your piece. Wow, thank you, thank you. I love the interpretations. And then now I have, um, <laughs> Well, I can see who's on Zoom before we hit the, the artist in the gallery. I'm gonna shift to Rhonda Gray. Okay, there we go. Hello. Hey, thank you so much, Fatima. Um, so happy to uh, be a part of this show with Five Points Art Gallery. I am my name is Rhonda Gray. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. And this is my first time showing with Five Points and looking forward to collaborating more with Fatima. Um, the pieces that I have, I have four pieces uh, in this show and three of them are part of my, what I call my coin collection. And it's a series that I uh, started last year. Uh, and I was inspired by the uh, release of the Maya Angelou uh, coin, as well as a trip to actually New Orleans, where Fatima is right now. Uh, it, it, um, we visited a uh, plantation in Louisiana, and uh, it just it brought up a plethora of uh, different thoughts. Uh, but to keep it short, um, after reflecting on that visit and uh, ideals surrounding uh, reparations and visibility um, and representation of black women, cultural aesthetics, so many different things. That's kind of where the coins uh, 
paintings uh, that's where they were born and uh, using uh, unconventional substrate of the circular uh, platter um, sorry and I have uh, I've been doing um, icon painting iconic uh, black women uh, just showing that perspective so in the show I believe we have um, Billie Holiday Shirley Chisholm and Katanji Brown. Um, I think they're behind you if I'm from looking at the screen. Um, and also uh, I have also started to create a painting assemblage, um, mixed media, and uh, it's almost likened to uh, a shrine. And um, I, you know, um, when Fatima, you know, brought this to the show to my attention, it kind of inspired me to paint this particular piece as this is an image of Fannie Lou Hamer. And I'm speaking of Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker. I've been wanting to do something with this image for them for a while. And this really kind of, uh, jump started this uh this that particular piece there and it's called the path of the of the love light and the form of the shrine kind of uh invites the viewer to um to experience the work you know in a another way perhaps right. and um i called it the path of the love light reflecting on a couple of quotes uh one from Fannie Lou Hamer where she uh, talked about, I feel sorry for anybody who is wrapped up in hate. And then there's one that I was reflecting on with Ella Baker, um, where she said, uh, give light and people will see the way, you know? And so um, oftentimes when we see pictures of Fannie Lou Hamer, she, uh, you know, does, does not look happy. And uh, a lot of my work has been uh, re exploring the, the stereotype of the angry Black woman. And uh, I believe that Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker were very powerful and they were operating from a place of love. Um, and they were very intelligent, passionate about um, fighting against injustices um, and coming from that perspective of a Black woman in America. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank you for explaining. And again, um, Rhonda's four piece, Rhonda Gray's four pieces are directly behind um, the audience. And then Kamika's pieces will, will be to my left, so to the right of the audience. It's like a mixed media collage piece. Um, Shayla, can you hear me okay? Yes. Are you able to turn the screen around? I believe, are the artists sitting behind the camera? Yep, I'll, I'll point it on there, but I do want to point out that you do have somebody else on the line. Frank D. We have Frank that just joined and also uh, Kenyon. Kenyon. Kenyon is helping Frank. Oh, okay. Okay. Frank, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can, yeah. You I know can... how to turn I don't know. I don't know nothing about this technology. It's all new to me. Okay. All right. So if you touch on... the screen, there are some icons at the bottom that will put, come up and then it'll say start video. Hold up. Let me see. It'll be right next to the microphone that you turned on. You just turned off. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Let's see. Look for a little video camera. It, it's like, it's a, like little. a little video camcorder. Video cam. Let's see. Uh, Zoom. It's, it'll just say start video uh, and it's down at the bottom when you touch your screen is right next to that see. microphone that you keep hitting. if you can't find it, don't be uh, I think you got it there we go a little dark but I just saw you a little bit <laughs> okay why don't I just talk I, I, I can hear you 
Yeah, you good. So um, just tell a, tell the audience about your pieces that you included. You got the, you know, the water coolers and the skateboard and tell them about yourself, where you're located and what you want them to know about you. And then why these pieces for this show? Frank. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Did you did you hear what I said? No. Nah. <laughs> just just tell the audience about you and the works in the show, and tell them where you're located. I'm located in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh. Uh. I've been an artist since 1983. I graduated from the University of Memphis undergrad, graduated from the Art Institute in Chicago, 2000. Uh, I don't know what else you need to know. <laughs> Tell them about your pieces. So we included the two water cooler tops and uh, um, your skateboard in the exhibition. Can you tell us about your process and why, you know, why those, besides me just selecting them, what they, what they represent? Uh, I work with found objects. Uh, I found the coolers on the side of the road and thought they was interesting to work with. I found the skateboard um, at the Art Institute. Somebody had thrown it away. So uh, I just uh, I just work with found objects and just breathe a new life into them and uh, just trying to find a better way to tell art instead of canvas and all the conventional means. So uh, um, I don't really like to talk. I just like to do work. So, uh, fair enough, huh? What'd you say? She said, Fair enough. She said, okay. Fair enough. That's oh, yeah. good. That's okay. good. We appreciate you signing on and talking. Okay. All right. All right. Um, y'all, yeah, Kayla, can you, y'all, let the show? Yeah. I'm well, I'm in I'm in New Orleans with my sister helping her move, and then but we got some artists at the show too. You see them at the top. Okay, y'all didn't invite me. Yeah, you were invited. Don't start on this. <laughs> I ain't know nothing you, about the show. Oh but my goodness, good. Frank! How did how did I get your work? I mean, I I mean, I'm I'm talking about the show in New Orleans. Oh, we on a whole another subject matter. <laughs> We focus on your show right now. Uh, okay. Okay. Do you know how to mute? Do I know how to what? Mute the call. No. Uh, <laughs> remember right next to, you've been hitting it, right next to that camcorder is like a mic. What'd you say? What'd you say? Right. Are you on the phone? Right yeah. next to the camera icon is the microphone icon. I don't know. I don't know what y'all are saying. Okay, you're all good. I, I can try to mute it for you. Okay. Now we will, um, you're good. Now we will what? Make sure she can come. We're going to um, jump to the other your your um, partner and artist division. And we will jump to um, Luther. Hi, Luther. Hey, hey, what's going on? You want to yeah. tell us where you tell us where you're from? Tell us about your work. And I want to thank you for coming in person. I hope you have enjoyed touring Milwaukee. <laughs> Yeah, it's been really chill here, liking the vibe. Um, I'm from D.C., Washington, D.C. 
Um, so we came in, I think Wednesday, so we've been kind of hanging out with the Philbury City, checked out the art museum. That's there, but um, my pieces are um, uh, Sisters Bond and American Dream, and actually the pieces for the fire. Um, I used um, lottery tickets and scratch offs for that process. So it's an upscale kind of body of work. Um, I actually, um, within the last two years, was real big on the public art and mural scenes in DC. So I had an um, in 2019, I exhibited at Art Basel in Miami, um, a couple of body of work there. But for the last couple of years, I wasn't able to really get to the studio and work. Um, so this exhibit actually forced me back into the studio, kind of forced me back onto canvas um, painting. Um, I actually didn't think I was going to be able to pull it off, to be honest. But um, like I said, I really wanted to do this body of work. I had it on my mind. I had this exhibit, the theme, everything kind of just went with the flow of what I wanted that body of work to represent. Um, so the reason I used the lottery tickets is the whole idea of this um, American dream. You know, like everybody has a pursuit for money and, you know, but that's to me, doesn't make you rich, you know? So I wanted to kind of put that aspect into the pieces. Um, and then also I see, you know, lottery is, is relatable to a lot of people. I feel like most people have probably played it at least once in their life, you know? So I, I wanted to kind of tie that um, aspect in it. And then the community aspect of the pieces for me too, is the fact that I'm using everyone's old losing lottery tickets and scratch offs. So it kind of brings like a community aspect to it. Um, you know, because I see like if somebody wrote on something like, hey, winning number or someone scratched their scratch off different from this other person. So now it kind of bringing that whole community aspect to the pieces for me. Um, and then it gave me a chance to just kind of take my time and get back to oil paint. So like the images are all kind of oil paint, um, black and gray. I didn't want to really focus on too much of that, you know, per se, but I wanted to take the attention off of that, but I still use a lot of like black images, you know, um, to portray our experience and more of a modern sense. Um, a modern day black experience, um, or just an American experience. I mean, because the series, you guys only have two pieces here, but the series is going to touch on a lot of different topics. Um, I'm going to go into the uh, connection between us as people, um, uh, and not just black people, just us as people, you know, and that's, you know, the American aspect to it as well, um, how we relate to each other. And then just, like I said, the, the more modern experience we have in our culture. Um, and I just wanted to tie those things into the piece. So it's a lot of things into it. The background, I used just raw lottery tickets. Um, and that kind of took a, a lesson I had in college where um, in my design class, we kind of played around with these images of lines and line work. So if you see, I used the red line to kind of make the design and kind of correlate that. But then I used the, the scratch off as more of an a African fabric that would kind of present see it all together so and I also incorporated little pieces of the previous exhibit I had called um, America I mean I'm sorry um, history of garments um, so it's a little bit of like little things from uh, history that we had incorporated I used money so you might see pieces of actual money throughout the pieces um, as part of the whole aspect of the, the dream and the chase and I also used pieces of jeans it's like uh, so that's like the more blue collar side, the hard working side of the, the, the common working person, you know, the, and that's what that represents. You know. mm -hmm. My question for you is Hi, everybody. My name is Rhonda Gavin A. Um, you said that you're going to have a series, there's going to be a series of uh, successive um, more pieces to that. Yeah. Will they all have? Um, Found yeah, so my, my, my goal is to actually use tickets from different cities, different states. I actually collected some while I was here. Um, nice. We met one of the guys at a bar, and he was showing us one of the pull off games you gotta have here. Yeah, we don't have that back home. So I have about 50 of those tickets he gave me. We just kind of wrapped and talking. So yeah, I mean, I want to use different things from different places because I think it would be more relatable to the people in those cities. Um, you see tickets from your own city and people can relate to that. You might have played that ticket before. It might be your ticket. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, that's how wild it is. You know, like, so I, I think that's the aspect of that. 
thing. Like you never know the mystery behind some of those things. Some of the, like I said, it speeds up people's lucky numbers. Some that people play every day, you know, and I just see the lottery and stuff, and I can see it's a consistent thing that people play for into every day, years and years. Of it. And some people never win. And it's just that whole hope and that hope of winning, you know, like, and, you know, that's the hope, like, where I wanted to capture it. I was, I was going to say, um, you can probably find some lottery tickets on the ground around the gallery because we right next to that liquor store. And that's one of the, like, things I'm picking up constantly but it, the community aspect already it also reminds me of like some of my friends mothers who would be like did you go play my numbers like yeah. everybody like what you said is trying to hope it, to get some kind of some win out of their circumstance when the odds are so low but they keep playing but that's one of their rituals is did you go play my numbers did you go play my numbers did you get to the store before they close to play my numbers and then the like the massing of all these lottery tickets and then like the gridding aspect to it. It almost looks like streets. And then the fact that there you have red lines and for like something in the neighborhoods that like this practice is more concentrated in. I, I just think that's so interesting and, and pretty, you know, nuanced and deep. All right, who do you want next, Fatima? Uh, question, just a question. Oh, question? we have a question in the audience. Yes, yeah, so I was wondering, did you, um, think about oh. the, did you think about the dynamics of that the lottery came from our traditional policy of running numbers? Um, well, I did think about like how they used to, you know, run numbers back in the day too. And that, like I said, that was part of the whole like upscale of like the modern day version of our experience, meaning like, that was how they did it back then. And a lot of people kind of have shown that through their work. So I wanted to kind of bring the modern day aspect of our experience now. Like, I mean, just recently we had uh, Powerball and stuff hit like, you know, historical numbers, but you had lines of people standing outside just to play numbers, one number. So at the end of that, no one wins. Look at all the paper and stuff that's just left over from that, you know? So, you know, like it's different from them time to now, as far as like, but I guess the, the damage too that they can do in the community, as far as just all the stuff that's left over from the, the drawing, you know, um, versus running numbers back in the day, people writing it down, had books, had letters, stuff like that, you know. Thank you for that question. Any other questions in the audience? Do you need, do you have a question? You have a question? I'm sorry. Did you, you have, have a question? question? No, I was, I okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Fatima, who do you want next? I'm gonna jump to Rhonda because I feel like some of the patterning and colors and then the concept of lottery, <laughs> is, <laughs> it, it plays off of um, Luther's work. So Rhonda, can you tell the other artists and in the audience about you, your work and the concepts behind your pieces included in This Is America? My name is Rhonda Gatlin Hayes. Um, I was raised in Milwaukee, but born in Gary, Indiana. I am a mixed media artist, um, assemblage, fabric. Um, the pieces that are over there, one name is Amanda, and the other one name is, oh, I can't think of it, Akina. And um, the fabrics I use, they are an um, extension of some, pre some previous math that I started making in 2017, I believe. They were originally on um, pedestals. And I had this desire to wanna, to me they looked skimpy and I wanted to make them a whole. They looked at, I wanted, my masks are, um, have their own person, person, persona. And so I wanted to, Try and figure out how to make a body to make this mask, it's not just a head, but an entire being. And so um, the fabrics are African fabrics, they're scraps, they're um, from my mother who left them fabrics when she passed away. Um, people have gifted me fabrics over the years. Um, uh, they're African fabrics mainly. And, and that's also assemblage. And, Akina 
is um <laughs> I was thinking about this as I was thinking, I'm like, okay, why why did I make these pieces? These these pieces always come, they they come like in floods, you know, like waters, they come in floods. I mean, I don't I don't have anything planned out when I do them. So and I'm thinking, I'm like, Akina is um the younger one. Well, she looks to me younger. She's a ponytail, she has braids, and she has this. Just a fashion, you know, this really elegant dress and um and all this bulky jewelry, you know, that's this and to me that's the younger generation um today. Um how they um are just it's it's about um to me, because I'm an older woman. It's about fashion. It's about you know. Look at me. Um, I, 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 I'm stuck. I'm, I'm it. So let's just you know. And then and the way Tima has it situated, I was sitting there looking at it. And I'm like, wow, okay. Um, and I've been thinking about intergeneration recently, and my mother-in-law is 97 years old, wow. and so. Um, the younger generation, she has a lot of grandchildren, but they never go see her. And she's the matriarch. And now she's, you know, since COVID, she has been, you know, away from the family, so to speak. So um, that's Akina. I'm sorry, Amanda is the, the younger lady, the young lady. And Akina is the older lady. I, I think she's older. Because she has the hair in a bun, she's more um, confined. Her her her, her body clothing is more um, what can I say? Just not as young ladies would not wear tassels. I know young ladies today would not wear any tassels. They wouldn't do that. But anyway, not unless you're old spirit, but. Yes, yeah, it has a reserved look. Thank you for what that's what I looked for. And so the fabrics, um, I don't particularly choose any fabrics as I'm patchworking the face. The fabrics just come. I don't preset any fabrics out. They if they work together, they work together. If they don't, they don't. But that's just my process. There's beads, there's African beads for um just to to bring out Afrocentric um, person of uh, persona of the pieces. And then to me, this is a younger, the younger generation and the older generation. Now, the younger generation, or older generation is, is no longer at the top. At the, normally, when I was growing up, the elders, they were the, you know, you go to the elders, you respect the elders, you, um, you know, you, you revere them. Now the elders they they they're, they're set aside, they're cast aside, and they're no longer important. That's that's what the pieces are for, and that's 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 what came out. I I didn't plan it. They and I, I tell people all the time that um I, I my my work is spiritual, and they, they think I'm crazy, but that's okay. I think everybody has a little bit of crazy, in it, and that's all right. So that's what those pieces came about. Um. I, I I can't do fast work um, because, it, like I said, it just it just comes away. I I can't explain it away. Thank you. Question about the time it takes to create one of these assemblage sculptures. <laughs> Yes, they, they, I can't really tell you because when, I'm only say a week for each one, maybe. Yeah, that's true. I'm just, I, um, because when it, when, it, when it comes, it comes in ways, don't come all at once, it, it, you know, because I have so many things and, and, and like I said, this, those pieces, <laughs> uh, Akina, the, the older lady, I wanted to put a dress on her like Amana. But really, I'm telling you, 
I don't want to dress. I want to cover. What? What you say? And I'm and my husband's like, so the piece is pizza. Yes, my husband's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, I, don't worry about it. I'm in the I'm in the, in the right, right, right. And I'm like, okay, no, I'm putting a dress on you. I'm telling you, I could not get the exact thing like Amana. It, it just wouldn't work. And I'm like, what? You want a coat? So if you look, it looks like a coat. I don't to me it looks like a coat. It's a cover. And so Yes, the pieces speak to me, people think I'm crazy, but that's okay. No. That's all right. I mean, you know, they they don't talk to they talk to me. And um, I was gonna put Bantu knots. I'm like, I need and you put no, I don't want Bantu, I want a bun. I need a bun. And, and the pieces, I use a lot of um different unconditional things instead of the, the, the bun being put up with hair pants is with dress pins. So yeah. Dress pins and the beads are put on there with nails, old rusty nails that were just sitting around. So yeah, it's it's a it's a a collection of things. Yes. Yeah. Right. Question back there. Yes. Are they named after someone or are you know? No. Um, Amana is is Swahili, and it means um loyalty, faithful at heart, and um. Akina is um, family bond, a bond, family bond. That's what, and, and she's actually a matriarch. So it, it goes together, um, the younger generation, and then she's the matriarch. Where years ago, the matriarch would be up, and now she's down. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, this is not a question. Um, but um, I'm really sorry to hear that um, the young generation is upset about their interviews. Um, your mom, a woman at the age of 97, she did get yes. a living book. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for celebrating her and um, sharing her story. And I really hope that you're going to make more work about her new experiences and stories that I wish she had to love, share. Yes, and I really would love a lot to uh, know about her story and the stories that I'm sharing that I hope that we're going to share more pieces mm -hmm. focusing on what she has to share and offer. I will tell, uh, my sister in law is an author, and, they're, and we're actually compiling a family book nice. with the stories of, of my mother in law. Yeah. So yeah, she's 97. She'll be supposed to be 98 next year. But the time doesn't persuade her. And then are there any more questions? August 2009. Pastor serving is are you yourself? And immediately reunites with his girlfriend. Okay, like, right. Hello, Frank. Give me one second. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I Hi, Mr. Payne. <laughs> um, I just said hi, Mr. Payne. I didn't know, I didn't see him until now until you um, turn the screen around. But I'm gonna jump to another um, visiting artist, Emmett Williams. You wanna tell the audience about your inclusion and some projects you're working on and you know about yourself in general? Sure. Uh, my name is Emmett Williams. I'm currently living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I, about five or six years ago, I was living in the South and I was driving down the road with this white person and we both saw this huge tree on a plantation. And me as a, we just had a conversation about 
me being a freelancer, filmmaker, photographer, and some other arts and things. And I was like, I want to start photographing trees. And every single white person I've told the story to since then has been like, oh yeah, trees are pretty. But every single black person that I've told about driving around the South, looking at huge trees has got it. And from that point on, I could not look at a tree in the South without wondering what violence had happened. Mm -hmm. And so I started um, doing some research and trying to photograph trees that people have been lynched on. And what I discovered is that most of the trees are gone and now they are city halls and empty street corners. Wow. And in St. Louis, um, it's a Hooters. And so, <laughs> and so we're like, we're, if you know history, if you haven't, don't ignore history, if you haven't been misled, you have a different relationship with everything you see. And so I started, um, so then I wanted to travel around the country documenting with video places where people have been lynched. And I happened to come across this kid at Duke who had the exact latitude and longitude of hundreds of locations. Mm -hmm. And so I have this huge spreadsheet of like 15 different states and all the um, all of all of these places where people were lynched and between the 1800 and, and the early part of the last century. And so my work is just about our relationship to place and space, depending on what you know about that space. If you're Black, Latino, white, every single space that you exist in, you're going to feel and think about that space differently. Mm -hmm. So that's the video right there. Um, there's going to be a it's just a small part of it, like one small section is like a whole, in November, there's gonna be a show in the other room where it'd be much, much bigger and more involved with that. So that's what I'm, that's me. I have a question. If the audience does that, I can't see the audience. So let them go first. Yeah, there's, there's two questions here. Okay. 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 How was that as calculated um, for the picture? No, um, this, this, yeah, this kid went through um, mostly newspaper reports. Um, and so with the newspaper reports, he has like, this happened at this corner and this corner. Um, so those are the, uh, are the exact, sometimes he's like, it's in this like general area based on newspaper accounts. And um, so I try, so I've got lots of them that are just like, it happened in the city, we're not sure where. So I concentrated on the ones that he knew exactly where they happened. I, I, I was gonna um, say that you get to one in the walking downtown area. Um, no, but maybe that, for, maybe for the- The focus on, is not just the South, it's all over yeah. the country. Um, and then uh, I like to, I want to say, I definitely appreciate the fact that you identify also that they um, cover the history, they try to hide the history with other buildings and structures um, <coughs> as means to deal with the awakening yeah. that um, um, racism had and political to hide those things. Um, that would be some meaning I mean, that, um, yeah, I appreciate that. I will. I will. I'll. I'll definitely include. I'll be back here in August. Plug. I film. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm mainly a documentary filmmaker, and there's a film that I've made called Sister Duela about infant mortality in the African American community that's touring around the country, and it's showing here August 12th that weekend sometime. And we're doing a huge yeah. maternal health event where the goal is for Black families to learn that they have options to the capitalist bullshit US health system. So, yeah, that's it. But I'll be back in August. I'll include the Milwaukee spot also. Mm -hmm. That would make you back to the way visiting. 
Yeah. So I make I make documentaries, um, and they're all like social racial justice, and I've been in some really hard, sad spaces. This is the only work where it like it breaks. It's like the um the uh like just like going through the spreadsheets and like obviously so many. Yeah, like like clicking on the stories, and I and I debated whether to include like the like. Oh, there's a good example. Like I just include like little bits of the stories, but like reading them like for a few hours is just the worst thing you can experience. Mm -hmm. It just it just breaks your heart what people like this went through. It's just it's too much. Um, I love the concept. I love everything. Uh, I was just like my brain was just going along with you guys were coming up with the idea to make this happen, but. One thing did stand up to me, like, have you ever thought of doing like interviews with like the ancestry? Like, if you could link it to the like people who were involved with instances from the white and black side mm -hmm. and see like how generationally that has like changed. The over. Impact, yeah, yeah. And yeah. also, and also in what's in the cities, like, if I go to, a, I'll go to like Moulton, Alabama, which is that one, or that's Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. But Going like going to like smaller towns and telling people why I'm there. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, that happened here. And like the impact of that is has been huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yes, I have thought of, about that. Hey. Have you ever yeah. Like, <laughs> have you ever got any like resistance or backlash from any of the locations that you want to say, like uh, get out of here? No. That's yeah. Ours. <laughs> no. Um if one on one of them you can see there's if you keep watching it there's a police car that like drives right in front of me and uh because i'm a documentary filmmaker i'm i i know the law of where you can and can't film so i'm pretty like every state i go to the aclu what happens if you get arrested thing and so i'm really prepared um so i haven't had resistance but i've been worried Especially if like so, I've have, I have all there's this one place in somewhere in the South Carolina, and I went to the spot, and on one side was like Trump flags and things, and the other side was like all these like rebel flags, and I and I like shared my location. And I was like, I'm not. I'm not I'm place. Place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's I mean that's been another thing is to see what became of those spaces. Um, yeah, like sometimes they're like a, there was one place that was like a cemetery, and on, on one side and like really run down on the other side. And I remember there there was like these two kids who were like curious about what I was what I was doing, and um, and yeah, it's 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 just it's very interesting to watch what has happened to those exact locations um, since then. Some of them have been like gentrified. Some of them have been whatever the opposite of gentrified is, like made worse. I don't know. Yeah. Something All right. When you mentioned the, your being in a location with the Trump flag, and this made me think, I was just looking at and actually doing some correlation myself of like, you know, uh, the nooses that are being found in African American or African Islam. The spaces like uh, the African American Museum in the sea, yeah. they found the loose, you know, in one of the exhibits and other places that you see that we look at the artists and the exhibits that are popping up even to this day. That it's not something in the past, the attitude yeah. still on um, the main. So I mentioned that as a prompt, just made me think that we still are finding this. We got this in this area that the loose is popping up. And, well, I'm from DC, and I can tell you that they came. <laughs> they came, bro. And I'm telling you, it was real out there for us. Say that again. I said, I'm from DC, and they, they definitely got real out there for us. Yeah. Like, and I was out painting in a lot of, you know, oh, wow. and, and, and protests and everything. So um, I even had art that was put into the um, Library of Congress, which was on the fence at the mm -hmm. White House. Uh, I was stopped by police officers thinking I was vandalized and stuff. Like it was, it was crazy out there. I mean, tanks rolling through our city, the army. Like, you know, it, it got crazy in DC for a while. Like, what year are you referring to? What time? 
this was during COVID, yeah. you know, Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. the whole, you know, a lot of my friends were like the artists that painted the street, Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. like that was a lot of my crew. We painted the whole city up, um, did a lot of positive messages. So uh, it, it, it's still like that in DC, so I, I can't say. <laughs> Um, Emmett, are there any um sites in Milwaukee that you found that people have been lynched? I was just informed of one, and so I will definitely be including that in the November show. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Um, they... so yes, yes okay. there will be. Okay, cool. Um, well, I would like to say last but not least, because that's the final artist that I see available, mm -hmm. and is Munir. Yeah, is there a question? Yeah, I see. I see him now, Munir Bahayudi. You want to hi? You want to tell us about your two highly praised? <laughs> and I'm giving you feedback that I've got highly sought after pieces in the show. Okay. And why and why those pieces? Okay. Thank you all for coming. My name is Munir Bahaudin, uh, born in Chicago in 49. Uh, and that's connected to the pieces because I think there's a lot of women who are not getting their hair done that way anymore. <laughs> Correct me. And is am I right? Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, but there is a sound that we would hear every Saturday night in the kitchen, which went like <laughs> And that was the sound of my mother accidentally burning the back of my sister's neck. So the, the, the name of these pieces are called uh, BKW uh, Black Kitchenware. So that's a, that's a double entendre there for a lot of people who don't know. But um, yeah, um, I got the, the two objects from Fatima. I just had an idea. Let, let me try to uh, do a, a simple drawing of each of these two implements. So it went from curling iron to the press and comb. It went from that to a butcher knife. It went from that to um, a hammer. And it also went from that to a monkey wrench. Does anybody know what a monkey wrench is? OK. So these two pieces that are out here in the gallery are two pieces part of a five-piece series. All of them are done that size. Um, and what I was really trying to do, which is really difficult for me as an African-American artist, uh, trying to minimalize the artistic statement uh, when there's just so much in our hearts and in our minds and our, our experience that you want to say. But that's where the, the discipline comes in, just trying to say as much as you can with the lead. So that's pretty much why you have just a simple line base piece. Uh, let's see. I like working, laying my stuff out uh, on tables uh, because material talks to you. You know, some pieces will say, put me in, some pieces will say, put me in. Sometimes the whole composition will say, just leave it alone, just walk away, leave me alone. And you may come back to it in a month, you may come back to it in a week. But the whole idea that listening to objects and materials, not only listening to objects and materials, listening to your tools and your brushes, because they'll say, put that down, right? <laughs> Don't put another mark on it, you know? So I go through that quite a bit, you know? Um, but when I was in school, with respect to the bigger frame of the composition, when I was in school, one of my professors said, when, when you start making your work, you gotta do things that are from your experience and things that you can relate to. So um, these are these two are part of a bigger series, um, and 
they all have this, some of them have a serrated edge. So if you was to look at the edge of a stamp, you know how the edges are perforated. Uh, so sometimes I try to do that in a stylized way. These may not have it, but the whole, that whole experience of doing the dotted or, or the serrated edge comes from uh, me collecting stamps when I was younger, you know, then you start looking at your stamps and seeing how very, they're very minimal, uh, the, the art in stamps, you know, uh, and they're very precise. And, and then I have this border that's going around them and I couldn't make that border, even if I tried. So I went to uh, Home Depot, uh, no, Office Depot, and you get those packages of certificates. So I just cut this, uh, the paper away, use that border edge that they, they have in those certificates to kind of give uh, the piece a sense of authenticity, like, like you do stamp. And then there is a red chop mark at the bottom that I'm using as reference for how a stamp is canceled when they were stamped. Uh, I was going back and forth in my head as to whether or not I should make that bigger, uh, but I just pretty much like the way it looks that way because it also looks like a Japanese chop mark on a print. Uh, so uh, I come out of the Art Institute where I studied ceramics and printmaking. So this is, these two pieces out here are the result of, of uh, my printmaking experience. And one of them, I think it's the curling iron. If you look at the handle of it, uh, the paper was woven uh, before mm -hmm. I cut it into uh, shapes and put it the way I wanted. The other one is the paper was crinkled and then I laid it back out and started uh, applying color and texture. But that's pretty much it in a nutshell. So I have a question. Okay. So can the audience hear? Yeah. So I loaned um, Munir the two hair, uh, hair uh, tools, the hot comb and the curling iron. They were my grandmothers who passed um, like two and a half, three years ago. I was really close to her. And I've since um, put those pieces in a shadow box. <laughs> Hmm. But you were talking about similar to Rhonda, like the spiritual communication between the tools and the work. And I was wondering if my grandmother said anything to you <laughs> while you were. That was her. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't say it. she did. But what I did do is I think on both drawings, there is this chemical compound you might see very subtle in the background. Uh, and that's a carbon chemin, uh, carbon compound uh, for, for melanin. Uh, because I figured there was a lot of people got burnt by those cones. <laughs> and that melanin was still somewhere on them cones. So. <laughs> Any other questions? You know, and, and I think from listening to all of the artists here, I think the importance of how, you know, the role of artists in documenting our contemporary experience um, is so important, right? We talk about um, how embodiment of this experience of what it means to be in this country. Um, I know a lot of us wrestle with, you know, the dichotomy of, you know, you look at items that bring in memory, that bring in a um, place and, you know, to the Emmett's idea of the tree, depending on what your background, your family history is, it could be a whole different experience as to how you even experience something, how you process something, what it means to you. And, and I think that the role of the artist in this contemporary landscape is really important in the way that we are documenting what it means, you know, generation of having survived and been here, you know, and to the point of the artists that say, well, you know, my obligation is not to document the challenges or the pain, but the joy, you know, and, and going back to this dichotomy of, you know, freedom and slavery, of 
pain and joy, of peace and war, of darkness and light. And mm -hmm. I want to just thank all of the artists that are able to share this with us. And I guess I just, my question to you all as we start wrapping up is, you know, as you are capturing this, whether it's your pool tap, by the way, I bought my first pool tap this year. So I love the joy of that. I'm like, what is it? I've been in Wisconsin all the year. This is my first time doing this thing. Um, but, but really this idea of, you know, as you're working through all of these memories, these mementos that are passed on by generations, um, what is it that you hope your audience is listening to? What do you want them to listen? Um, I think that that's one thing to know that every experience is different. And capitalistic breaks will explain. We all have different paths, but we have to look at our paths and do that. I play a lot of Coltrane and Thelonious Monk and Miles Davis when I'm doing my work. So I'm hoping they can hear that in my work when they look at it, you know, and I don't know what's gonna happen. Yeah, like a soundtrack plan. Yes, yes. Because quite often I may hear a drum rhythm and I'm thinking, did I put that in there? Did I, did I get that, you know? Uh, so it's always about trying to remember ancestors to music. Um, for me, I want to get, I want to get, I, I was thinking earlier, I said, I don't even know where I got that, I didn't have a body, it was Tima who said to me something about power symbols, I mean, power um, statue, is that right, Tima? Then you, what's she She didn't, she didn't. Oh, then you said that about power statue. She struggles. Oh, no, no, oh my goodness. We can't hear you, can't hear me. Oh. What'd you say? I said, then aren't you the one that that, that um was talking to me about power statues? Power statues. What extension? Power statues. Power statues. Yes, power, power statues, power figures. Yes, that's where I got that from. I'm thinking like. Where did I get that from, from her, from, from Fatima? And that's where I wanted to have the idea to have a body. Um, and it, it came about, you know, and Fatima, I worked for, as a gallery. I've been here fortunately for two years and um, I've learned a lot. And, and she, um, I, I can see, I have daughters, my daughters here in the audience, that's Rachel. <laughs> and they're all around the same age. So um, I can see how I remember Fatima's grandmother. She was just a single person. Fatima just loved her grandmother. She, um, she took very good care of her. And I think about, you know, um, that's what I, I mean, we lack that in our, we lack that. We really do. And I just hope that um, these pieces that I made, um, that came out, um, allow the younger generation to, to go to the, um, the elders, because there is a lot of knowledge, a lot of, um, I know Fatima talked about her grandmother, helped her, showed her how to garden and, and things of that nature. She learned a lot from her grandmother. And just, to, to level on the, the, the elderly because the, 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 the younger generation are our future. And if we don't grab hold to the knowledge that these people, these young, these older people have, our generation, we're not gonna have any more people. They, we're, gonna dis we're gonna dissolve because all they know now is computers. So this, this, computers. Is technology it, has a play on it. Yeah, and, and yeah, the thing about it is, so if I go to an elder, I can get food. But 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 that's but, why a lot of people are looking at it. Well, yes, however, but there's a there's a traditional way of doing gardening. Right now, you you can't get um, a real seed. A lot of these these watermelons are seeds, right? yeah. and they're not real. They're not real, and so I say that to say we need to tap in as. Um, younger people, middle-aged people, older people, we need 
gentrified, we gentrified intergeneration, intergeneration the, the groups so that we can learn how to garden, how to sow. The sowing is gone. I mean, the way things are going, this is just me. My husband called me the spirit theorist, and I, I admit to it, but if the um if the uh EMP hit, we done because my phone, I don't know nobody's like phone number. I don't know nobody's phone number. I don't know anybody's phone number. So we need to, you know, um, and we and we and we'll be crippled. When when a couple of years ago we had the the, the, the electric out, I was four days. It was horrible. People were didn't know what to do when the power was out. Am I wrong? So we need to be able to get back to the basics. But see, young people don't have a camera. They don't know about no camera. <laughs> They don't know they don't know about yeah. they don't know nothing about taking a can of oil in the in the kitchen and lighting a match and making a candle. They don't know nothing about that. But I do. But I'm afraid to lady. That's it. <laughs> okay. I'm not getting off my soapbox. Sorry, question back there. Oh, that's a comment. I I but when she's teaching me how to make my hands if I can, and she shows me her methods of doing it, it feels like it's a mini in my culture because I'm I've already been yelled at for still being on the call, but um, I want to thank everyone for, um, again, participating, coming to support, coming to see what's new, coming to learn, and even the artists for being, sharing their vulnerabilities through the visual arts and their stories. Um, I appreciate everyone's time and their commitment to this process and practice. So um, I just want everybody to come back, encourage, share, purchase work. All work is for sale. And then, um, yeah, enjoy yourselves. Thank you, everyone. There's 15 amazing artists in this space. Uh, please take time to really absorb what the messages that they have to say. Thank you to folks that are here today and that were able to join us online. Having your presence here obviously adds a layer of context to this beautiful work that we have here. And remember, this is America. <laughs>